Good afternoon, everyone. Um, in this session, we'll be looking at the innovative treatment um, law reform debate in the United Kingdom. And um, it follows nicely on from the previous session, which I found fascinating. Thank you. Um, we're going to be talking about the role, again, about the role that the law plays in facilitating innovation. And um, it also raises interesting questions, I think, about what innovation actually is. Um, the um, presentation from me will cover three uh, issues. Firstly, um, some introductory material about the um, Medical Innovation Bill that was um, proposed in um, the UK. Got a very um, English flavour to this afternoon's um, discussions. Secondly, I'm going to talk about an overview really of the Australian law about um, people seeking damages for um, the consequences of innovative treatment. And then um, I'll pose the question, which I think will be answered by Harry. Um, he gets the hard part of the afternoon's work, um, about um, whether we need um, law reform to um, facilitate responsible innovation in this country. So um, looking then to the um, English debate about the um, proposed uh, law reform. In 2011, the advertising guru, um, Maurice Saatchi, who um, happens to be a life peer of the House of Lords, sadly lost his wife, the novelist Josephine Hart, to ovarian cancer. Writing about the calamity that affected his family, Lord Saatchi highlighted the current innovation-averse culture in the UK national health system, with cancer patients routinely being prescribed a standard procedure which he described as degrading, medieval and ineffective and leading only to death. Lord Saatchi has stated that he believes that it's the fear of being sued for medical negligence which is preventing doctors from trying new treatments that may not necessarily save an individual patient but which will advance the pursuit of a cure for cancer. Accordingly, in 2013, Lord Saatchi introduced a private member's bill to promote responsible innovation without the fear of negligence claims. The bill was adopted by the Health Secretary, um, Jeremy Hunt, and a Department of Health consultation was launched on the proposals. In the video that I'm about to play, um, which was published on the Telegraph newspaper webpage, Lord Saatchi urges readers to join um, him in the fight to change medical practice in the treatment of cancer, hoping to eventually find a cure for the disease that killed his wife. Um, we need to say loudly and clearly, Lord Saatchi urges his readers, um, what, that we want to try new treatments for cancer where the old ones are known to lead only to death. We want to escape being doomed to repeat an endless cycle of failure. So here's um, Lord Saatchi. Let's come, to the, let's come to the acid test. Put the case of the doctor standing at the bedside of the cancer patient. Put the case that the doctor, seeing what lies ahead for this patient, poor life quality, followed by death. Put the case that the doctor is considering an innovation. At that moment, between the doctor and the patient, a red light appears. The red light is the law. At that moment, the doctor must ask himself this question. Do I want to go ahead along this road of innovation? If I do, and anything goes wrong, there will be a trial. I will be accused of medical negligence. In the uncertainty of a trial, I could find that my livelihood, my reputation, my family are all ruined. And therefore, I might come to the conclusion that the only safe path is to stick to the um, standard procedure, even though I know where that leads for this patient. So the Medical Innovation Bill which, as I say, is now being taken forward by the government in this consultation, is hoping to provide doctors with a clear path to lawful innovation. We don't want patients to be treated like mice, 
and to be the subject of reckless experimentation which puts their lives at risk. But on the other hand, we do want bold, scientific, responsible innovation. The Medical Innovation Bill, in the opinion of the government, achieves both those aims and that's why it's being taken forward. If um, Telegraph viewers, readers, would like to see more innovation in cancer, then please do respond to the Department of Health consultation paper, which is going to be available online, and we, we could then well see this bill receive royal assent very soon. If it can help one other person to be saved from the horror of a cancer diagnosis and treatment, followed by a gruesome death, then um, that would be a blessing for us all. There was a public consultation process once the bill was um, initially drafted. And um, during the consultation process, so um, you would expect, there was um, a great deal of debate. And um, it became clear that while, of course, there was widespread support for the promotion of responsible innovation, the quest um, to find um, cures for uh, diseases, um, there was also concerns expressed about whether an appropriate balance had been struck in the draft, um, in the draft legislation. Issues such as um, providing you know, the, the balance between providing doctors with legal clarity and confidence when they wanted to innovate compared um, with facilitating uh, patient access to innovative treatment and improving patient safety by discouraging in, um, irresponsible innovation. Um, it's a wonderful world when um, you can access experts all around the world so easily and we're very fortunate um, that um, Slater and Gordon is an international law firm with um, an expert practitioner, Dr Darren Conway, who was um, very much involved in the debate, who has kindly provided us with a recorded um, interview about his insights and expertise um, involved in this debate. So we have um, crossing over to London again with Dr. Um, Darren Conway. So my name is Dr. Darren Conway. I'm a solicitor with Slater and Gordon in London. Uh, prior to uh, converting to be a solicitor, I was in medical research. I have a PhD in genetics, and my primary research interest was in neurological conditions, and I worked at laboratories in London and Philadelphia. Lord Saatchi's wife died of a rare form of ovarian cancer in 2011. Uh, Lord Saatchi considered this to be a wasted life. Uh, he also decided that the fear of being sued inhibits doctors from innovative treatments. Uh, he's decided he wants to help cure cancer and other rare diseases, uh, and he's decided to do this by removing the fear of being sued from doctors hence bringing forward his Medical Innovation Bill. The intention of the Medical Innovation Bill is that provided a doctor complies with Section 1, Clause 3, they will have a defence to a claim for clinical negligence. What Lord Saatchi has said is that he wants to bring forward the Bolam test from being a retrospective analysis by the court to being a prospective analysis to give certainty to doctors. He says that from the patient's point of view, this will provide them with access to new and more innovative treatments. Uh, for the courts, he says that currently the law is ambiguous and his bill would add clarity. Uh, for doctors, he says that the bill would add certainty, provided they comply with this checklist, they cannot be sued for clinical negligence. In the early days, the Medical Innovation Bill had some very favourable media coverage. Lord Saatchi has a media team. Uh, they have had more than one website, they have a Twitter account, uh, and they have a Facebook page. However, with time, and as the wording of the bill has got into the public domain, there's been an increasing amount of criticism from all sides. Uh, this includes 
doctors organizations, patient organizations, charities, researchers, and lawyers. The main and fundamental criticism of the bill is that there is simply no evidence to support the contention that fear of litigation inhibits doctors from innovating. Indeed, the evidence is to the contrary. Almost all of the medical defence organisations in the UK who have commented state that they have no evidence to support that contention. Quite the opposite. Therefore, the Medical Innovation Bill is based on a false premise. Uh, the danger is it will therefore reduce patient protection. It will increase uh, the scope for charlatans to operate. It may bypass current rules on research uh, and clinical trials. And it may well increase litigation in the longer term. One clear criticism is that despite the attention being focused on patients with cancer or who are terminally ill, the bill as currently drafted applies to all patients with all conditions being treated by all doctors. That includes children, the elderly and the vulnerable. It is not restricted to patients with cancer or who are terminally ill. This is quite chilling because Patients who can currently successfully sue for clinical negligence will be prevented from doing so if the doctor can use the Saatchi defence. This is all the bill actually does. It removes a right for a patient to sue for clinical negligence. The concerns about the bill are not restricted to its premise or its content. Um, it also extends now to the way the bill has been promoted. Uh, by way of example, the government um, commenced a consultation on the bill in early 2014. At the conclusion of the consultation, uh, the Saatchi team uh, made public their view that there were approximately 19,000 responses of which the majority were supportive of the bill. I made an application under the Freedom of Information Act to the Department of Health. They tell me that there were 170 responses to the consultation, of which the majority did not support the bill. On the surface, the Medical Innovation Bill appears to be a genuine attempt to promote innovation. Who does not want to find a cure for cancer? The reality is that it's likely to open Pandora's box. For patients, it removes a right of redress. They will not be compensated for negligently caused injuries. For courts, it's likely to increase litigation, partly because the bill solves a problem that doesn't exist, and partly because the wording of the bill leaves open a lot of interpretation. For doctors, those doctors that fail to make out a Saatchi defence may well be found to be negligent. For the rest of the population of doctors, this may mean they will take a step back from trying innovative treatment for genuine fear of being sued as a consequence of this bill. Essentially, the Saatchi bill fails in its stated aim. I am an ex-medical researcher. I support responsible innovation. I'm also aware of the real barriers to innovation, which I hope you'll be able to discuss in your forum today. The Medical Innovation Bill simply does not address either of these points. It is, in fact, a quacks charter. For more information and for a balanced view, I suggest you look at the website for the Stop the Saatchi Bill team. Thank you. There you go. So um, it's wonderful to have both um, the perspectives in, in the debate. Um, I thought it might be helpful, and we're very mindful of, of time constraints, um, to just present um, a snapshot of the legislation which you've actually been given as part of your materials. But firstly, um, it, it is right. There is a basically one provision in the, in the legislation which says that um, if a doctor um, 
a doctor is not um, negligent by um, departing from existing treatments where the decision is made responsibly. So that creates a defence which is available for doctors, um, would have been available for doctors uh, who are engaged in innovation. Um, the, the Act then goes on, the bill then goes on to um, set out what um, could amount to responsible innovation. It sets out a, a process which is in the um, materials you have, it's on the slide. I, I think it's um, probably um, in the interest of time better to um, progress with um, the sections. You can have a, a look at it, but obviously it involves consultation take with other um, expert practitioners, taking account of the views, getting consent, exercising judgment, um, recording on an a innovation register and um, making sure, as is always advised to practitioners, to record everything in the notes in case it's um, challenged uh, afterwards. Uh, what does the Act not do? Well, the Act says that it doesn't um, relate to purely um, uh, research um, projects. Um, it doesn't relate to non-therapeutic or cosmetic um, procedures. Um, it focuses on doing um, procedures that are in the um, best interests of the patient. And um, interesting, it also says that it doesn't abolish, affect or limit existing law. No doubt the lawyers um, would be um, thinking that it's ripe for um, lots of litigation to work out what's within and what's without the, um, the um, specific um, defence. Um, what happened with the Act? Darren um, has been on standby for us in the UK reporting back and we've been following um, the debate in the UK only on Friday last week after Darren recorded his um, video. Um, the whole thing came to a head, I guess an end, um, in the current parliament. Um, the process in the UK was for him, uh, uh, Lord Saatchi, as a peer to put a private member's bill forward, which he did in the House of Lords. It was debated there, put then into the House of Commons. Um, it um, was due to be debated last, um, last Friday. And, um, oh, March, actually, it's February, isn't it? Is it March already? Sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Head all behind in myself. Oh, the year's going a bit too fast for my liking. Anyway, whatever month it was last Friday, um, the bill then was blocked um, by the Liberal Democrats um, and it doesn't look like there'll be time in the current parliament for it to be debated ahead of the general election. Um, Norman Lamb, in response to criticism, you know, that he has um, stopped a very important piece of, of litigation, has now put forward a proposal um, which they, it says that there should be a review conducted um, by an eminent person to um, evaluate um, things a little bit more in terms of what the true barriers are and um, start the process again if needed. Um, briefly, um, a, a quick snapshot of the law in Australia to put um, into context what Harry will, will say. Um, in, um, if you're looking to bring a civil, for the non-lawyers in the room, if you're looking to bring a civil claim for damages, you normally would bring a negligence claim which involves looking for a duty of care, which is usually found in the case of, of doctors, and then showing that the treatment didn't meet the um, requisite standard. And it's at that um, aspect of the negligence action that the bill is focusing, providing a defence um, for doctors who engage in um, innovation, responsible innovation. The law in Australia is a little bit different um, to the law in the UK. Um, indeed, um, we have what is um, known as a modified um, Bolan test, where we uh, defence has been across most of the, across the civil across the jurisdictions in Australia by the Civil Liability Act, um, where if a doctor is not deemed to be negligent, if they can establish by reference to a body of peer professional opinion that um, their treatment was accepted, subject to an overriding um, right in the court to decide that um, the treatment was irrational. There's um, been a, a case in the UK which um, has interpreted um, this type of provision and indeed it was a, a, an easier case in, in the sense that it was a minor without capacity 
on whom um, this treatment was going to be um, performed. So a declaration was sought from the court that it was appropriate to treat the child. So it was a good case for this to have been decided. And you can see um, the court found that it was sufficient if you could find a sm even a small body of peer opinion um, to engage in the innovation. Um, and the court thought that if you uh, interpreted the Bolan test too rigorously in this context, we'd never see any innovation. So do we need law reform to facilitate um, responsible innovation? Well, it seems that from the experience in the UK, um, we should be looking towards an evidence-based approach. It's clear that patients need access to innovative, safe and effective um, treatment. We should be focusing on removing barriers that prevent innovation so that we can have advances in medical um, knowledge. The, um, the, the way that the reform process fell in the UK was that it was based on that uh, very much on the fear of medico-legal consequences. Um, there was little evidence to support that, so we need um, further research. Um, in the course of the, um, of the debate, the um, British Medical Association um, responded um, to the consultation. And um, you know, in the, in the current um, environment, what can we do in terms of um, fostering responsible innovation? Well, it seems that the two um, limbs um, that are required are institutional support in the sense of professional guidance, um, clinical ethics um, committees, registers of, of clinical experience, and also education informing and guiding doctors and to improve their understanding of the law and encourage them to re in innovate responsibly within the law as it stands. And that's why um, Harry's here as, a, as the expert to talk about the uh, medico-legal issues, not just civil liability, but also significantly, as we saw in the last presentation, disciplinary liability. Thank you, Tina. Um, you'll be pleased to know my slides are very short. Um, how do I get to those? They'll come up in a moment. Um, I like the Good Samaritan app. It reminds me of a client who invited a 19-year-old female patient to his unit to allow her to use his computer to um, complete a university study. And uh, his constant phrase to me over a number of years of um, dealing with him was that he was just being a good smartian. Um, <laughs> English wasn't his first language, and in one occasion, thinking of brain impact apnea, I remember him saying to me that some documents held by the medical board were very important, and we had to sub-apnea them. <laughs> so um, that, that's my take on the Good Samaritan there. Um, innovation, to me, the whole thing comes down to a question of balance. Um, and... It's a balance between the interests of developing treatments which improve outcomes for patients against regulating people who might, for financial gain, status, or desire to demonstrate their um, incredible research ability, provide treatments which could harm un or are unproven or which may be seen as preying on desperate individuals. And it's a difficult thing getting that balance right. One of my favourite quotes, which I pull out whenever I can because it is my favourite quote, is this one from Lord Denning, who said that in relation to a case where two people suffered some very significant injuries as a result of being um, treated with uh, medication which had been... Uh, the ampules in which they were stored had developed microscopic cracks and bacteria had entered and, and uh, caused harm to the patients. And Lord Denning said, it's very easy to be wise after the event and condemn as negligence that which is misadventure. We have to be on our guard against it. He said, medical science has conferred great benefits on mankind, but these are attended by considerable risks. Every surgical operation is attended by risks. We cannot take the benefits without taking the risks. Every advance in technique is also attended by risks. And he went on to say that, you know, these people have suffered terrible consequences, a natural feeling they should be compensated, but it would be a disservice if we treated or imposed liability for everything that happens to go wrong. And his concern was that doctors could be 
uh, led to think more of their own safety than the good of the patients. Innovation would be stifled and confidence shaken. And I think this is the same sort of concern that was driving Lord Saatchi. However, whether or not um, doctors are concerned about being sued is only one part, I think, of the, the issues that need to be considered in looking at um, what would be the impact of, of trying to encourage <clears throat> innovative treatment. The current position for most doctors, if they're trying to develop something new, is that they firstly get it approved by an ethics committee and they go through trials and they determine whether, in fact, it is uh, effective. Um, they publish a paper. If it's um, in a, a peer-reviewed journal, that's considered good evidence. Um, and then that guides treatment. Unfortunately, that takes time. And, of course, there are people who are looking for an instant cure now. The difficulty with that also is that there are patients who can be quite desperate. Um, and if uh, someone says to them, I don't know if this treatment will work, but it might work for you. Um, and, you know, they may be prepared to pay $10,000, $20,000 um, to go and have a treatment. You'll all remember the case of Dr Patel, who um, had some patients in Bundaberg, who, um, one of whom had come down to Brisbane to be assessed by um, the Royal Brisbane Hospital uh, relevant department. Um, and that department had said to the patient, we cannot do any surgical treatment for you. We're now in a palliative stage and um, you need to go back and, and work through the palliative stage. Um, he went back to Bundaberg and Dr Patel said to him, in fact, we can do some surgery and, you know, it, it might be a small chance, but there's a chance that we can actually remove the cancer. Um, and the patient opted to, uh, to go with that, um, that advice and, and had the operation and died. Um, and so that's, I think, a, quite a good indication of the sorts of dilemmas that are raised. And I'm not trying to suggest any particular answers to you. Um, I, I'm just here to raise some of the questions that I think need to be asked. Um, and we need to be very sure about what we're trying to achieve when, we prom when we're encouraging innovation. In terms of a medical defence position, because I work for a medical defence organisation, um, there is certainly uh, a, a desire to see doctors um, improve, but it must be done in a responsible way. And one of the ways we have that, for instance, in the insurance policy is to say that um, we will cover you for claims as long as you're acting within your category of practice um, so that we can see that you're doing things that responsible group of doctors would like to be, see to be done. Um, the other matter that I think doctors need to take into account in considering whether to do innovative treatment is not just can I be protected against claims, is a van going to stand behind me or another medical defence organisation? It's is there going to be potentially some disciplinary uh, issues that arise out of this? Because there's nothing in the Lord Saatchi Bill that talks about um, the doctor being protected against um, disciplinary action. It simply says that it's not a departure from accepted treatment to do this. But the standard for disciplinary action in Australia, basically under the uh, national law, is that it is unsatisfactory professional performance if you do something which, in the opinion of the decision maker, would be considered by the doctor's peers or the public as um, uh, uh, something of a lesser standard than could be reasonably expected. So it is quite a different test in the disciplinary scene. And it's conceivable that someone could say, well, um, patient, you've got cancer. Um, Everyone else has told you it's a palliative case, um, but I think that you know we can try this new uh, treatment. Hasn't been approved by the TGA, uh, but but it's it you know it could work. I don't know if it'll work, but it could work. Um, it's going to cost you ten thousand dollars, but give it a go, um, and uh, the patient receives absolutely no benefit, and uh, and there's a lot of money expended down the track, and sometimes they may in fact go through a lot of pain. 
uh, in, in trying to undergo these treatments. Um, now, it's quite conceivable that in that circumstance, the family may not sue the doctor for compensation, but may refer the doctor to opera or in Queensland to the ombudsman. Um, we have the benefit of the ombudsman here. Um, and uh, as a result, um, uh, it may be that the doctor faces some disciplinary action. So I guess I think we need to hasten slowly uh, from a medical defence point of view. I think doctors, whilst um, it is very important that we do encourage innovation, we need to do it responsibly. Um, and for that purpose, one of the concerns that I have is if you look at what Lord Saatchi says is that the criteria in subsection 3 um, for uh, what needs to happen to demonstrate responsible practice um, is the doctor should speak to another, another doctor. Um, and I, I think it's more than just another doctor. I think you need to have an ethics committee or something like that, uh, which is uh, people who really understand not just the impetus, because you have a lot of pressure from your patient, I need something, I want something, but understand what is the impact going to be on that patient, on that patient's family, all of the ethical issues that are raised in, um, in such a circumstance, which I think is very difficult for a single individual to be able to give a good balanced view about. The other thing that I am pleased to see in the Act is that there has to be a very clear record of the advice given to the patient because that's not always done well. And I'll just end with a very brief story about records, uh, recording advice it, and the importance of it. Um, and the reason for that is patients often don't recall properly what is said to them in a consultation and can take it completely out of context. An example of which is a man went to visit a friend on a rural property, and couldn't find him in the farmhouse, went down to the equipment shed and saw him standing in front of a tractor and he was gyrating slowly and starting to undo his shirt. And so his friend said to him, what on earth are you doing, mate? And he said, I'm following my doctor's advice. And his friend said, what sort of advice is that? He said, well, I've had some intimacy issues in the marriage and I went and saw my GP and he said to me, the problem is, is that you're not proactive enough. You need to be more proactive I want you to go straight home and do something sexy to attract her. <laughs> Thank you very much.